Good afternoon to everyone present here today. I open the hearing number nine of the regular period of sessions number 183rd entitled the situation of forced eviction and agrarian policies in Paraguay, which was requested by the coordinator of human rights of Paraguay. My name is Estuardo Rallon. I'm the first vice president of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights and special rapporteur, uh, country rapporteur for Paraguay. Here with me today, we have Commissioner Esmeralda Arosemena de Troitinho, Commissioner Roberta Clark and Commissioner Carlos Bernal. Also, we have the presence of the executive uh, secretariat and her its representative, Claudia Pulido, and our uh, special reporter, Soledad Garcia Muñoz. Let me begin with a greeting to the representatives of the state, the civil society, and the representative of the United States, Jan Jarab, who will be here with us during this hearing. Also, we wanted to explain the distribution of time. We will begin with 20 minutes allocated for the civil society who will be sharing their points of view and the situation in the context of the theme for today. Then the state will also have 20 minutes to uh, provide their inputs on the theme of this hearing. We will give seven minutes to the United Nations expert, then the commission will have 20 minutes to make comments or questions. And then we will uh, return and give back the floor to the civil society organizations for 10 additional minutes for their reply. The same amount of time, 10 minutes to the representatives of the states for their comments. And we will have the closing of the session by the commission. Some additional in instructions. We have a digital tool to measure time, simultaneous interpretation and closed captioning. These hearings are public. They are being streamed live via webcast and the recording is uh, saved on the commission's YouTube channel in its original language and in English. So without further ado, we start the hearing by giving the floor to the civil society with, for 20 minutes. guarantee peace in uh, the in the fields it's necessary to have a specific uh, action being taken we have to correct uh, a problem with language there are no peaceful trespassing because all trespassing are violating the constitution and law so all trespassing are violent and evictions are not violent evictions are peaceful because they restore the law and restore social peace were you evicted yes we were evicted we were attacked. Article 142 of the criminal code was uh, amended and it made the encroachment of privately owned property a crime. In Paraguay, there are 12 million hectares of land which are uh, not rightly owned and they are public land and some uh, congressmen amended this law so that the families of this lands would be uh, would be criminals. We want to stay in our homes. Where would we go if we don't have an, a home? Instead of recovering the land, the state deployed all its forces against the population who was already vulnerable. Today, almost 500 people are affected by forced evictions. In 2021, this was the figure, and they are completely abandoned by the state. Good afternoon, 
everyone. Before I begin, I wanted to thank our colleagues from the Human Rights Platform and Memory and Democracy for these images uh, that we just showed. Also, I wanted to express on behalf of the Paraguay's Human Rights Coordinator our uh, thanks to the Commission for uh, holding this hearing, which is especially important for our country right now. Um, also, we are here on behalf of the civil society. We have Ana Romero. She is from the Guarani people. She's a member of the National Articulation for a Dignified Life. We have Ramon Medina here. He is uh, a leader. Uh, we have the lawyer Abel Areco, who is part of the legal team of the Coordinator of Human Rights of Paraguay. And I am the uh, Executive Secretariat of the CODEOB. Paraguay is in this situation, which can have the multiplication of these types of images we just shown. In 2021, uh, in this period of this report of Code Wupi, we have seen an increase of uh, forced evictions that have affected uh, different communities. These evictions, without any legal control that is, is being instituted by the police and private guardians in the service of land owners, usually are in which are usually in cooperation with the state. We see uh, orders for evictions against indigenous communities which do not recognize the rights and also against other vulnerable groups under different types of legal uh, concepts without providing any guarantee. These evictions uh, create destruction and the, and the setting of fire of different uh, houses, churches, and the, the massive uh, arrest of the uh, inhabitants. There are many cases in which there are torture cases being alleged, and also the uh, summary execution of uh, different people, which are still impugned, and the magnitude of this tra tragedy which is a systematic infringement of different types of rights is the result of a state policy which has the goal to displace rural population to have free land for agribusiness with these lands which are being stolen from indigenous people. This practice is not new and this commission knows this very well. Forced evictions are uh, a form of repression, which is part of a, a policy that we can call extermination, which has meant 120 people dying in the context of the struggle against this mass evictions and fumigations. These evictions happen under the protection of a political discourse that has exacerbated the protection of private property and leaving aside other types of property rights, such as a collective indigenous prop property and other human rights, such as the right to housing, food, or work. As an example of this, in 2021, the Congress of Paraguay, not listening to the international uh, recommendations to stop, to stop COVID, rejected the possibility to discuss a bill to create a stop to evictions. That is why the Chamber of Deputies, as a response to this initiative, pronounced itself to be a defender of private property. For the state of Paraguay, there is no uh, recognition of other types of property and no recognition of the respect, guarantee, and satisfaction of a very wide range of human rights which are at risk in this rural conflict, especially in the context of the dissemination and outbreak of coronavirus. Lastly, dear commissioners, if this human rights crisis is not addressed from the uh, point of view of Paraguay's obligation, and as well as from the point of view of the 
international community related to human rights, in the short term, we could be facing an even more drastic situation against sectors who are already extremely vulnerable and even in the face of a social upheaval with unwanted consequences which has been provoked by a government that only provides protection to a sector of the population. I give the floor now to my colleague, Ana Romero, from the indigenous sector. Good afternoon to everyone, to the representatives of the commission and their representatives here today. The indigenous peoples have been, have been attacked during centuries. The current generations have to face a globalized world, which is in constant innovation and added to this, the pandemic. Over the last 30 years of being part of a legal group to be uh, defending our rights in the uh, constitution in the chapter number five, and even in article 62, there is the recognition of the existence of indigenous peoples before the formation of the state of Paraguay, which in the following uh, articles of this chapter also uh, show the other guarantees and rights that we should be enjoying. However, from then what the constitution establishes has not been guaranteed. One of the minority populations of this country, only 1% of this uh, of this country cannot apply public policies correctly. As we saw on the video, out of the 13 indigenous communities that have been affected, we have the community of Kapapapu, which has been brutally evicted into instances despite having a title of their uh, property in process. This procedure was violated, including a resolution to protect the rights of the community, which was in force at the moment of the second eviction. That is, they use legal mechanisms for their own benefit. As a consequence of this, entire families had to migrate from their illegally owned lands and ancestral lands two times the capital city. They have to face their different situations such as uh, asking for money at the red lights, uh, sexual abuse, or the commission of different uh, punishable acts. This speaks to a uh, violation of these communities, which have not the access to health and education, which shows the inability of the uh, incumbent governments to promote and above all to protect the rights of the most vulnerable uh, people such as uh, women, child, and elderly people. We also have the Huapowim community, which at the end of the year was evicted from their ancestral lands and today are just scattered around. They did not have the opportunity to intervene in this uh, situation, this eviction. This was a surprise for the whole community. This is when all this economic, social, and cultural rights were brutally infringed without respecting the most sacred thing, which is the ancestral cemetery of these indigenous people. This was a, a proof of the state having not provided any other alternative. These rights, which are enshrined in the national constitution in Article 64 of a collective property, there are the guarantees of the uh, tenure and security for those types of lands and the pro prohibition of the transfer of the people who inhabit them without their prior consent. However, the state infringing its own constitution attacks leaders and representatives of the communities affected by these evictions, leaving them without any defense or protection and constantly prosecute, persecuting them, which means 
an eviction that creates emotional instability for children who are terrified and cannot continue their education in schools, which lead them to drop out. There are thousands of children, adolescents, which are traumatized by this because there was no types of special mechanisms implemented in the face of this inhuman situations. This is pointed out in the report in detail. We want to remind the state that we have three favorable sanctions, which they are not complying. We also order the state to modify these procedures because this is not effective. Thank you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon, everybody. Firstly, I would like to say that in Paraguay, there are more than 7 million hectares of uh, lands that are occupied according to the law. And these gave, gave place, gave room to a report in 2028. And most of the urban communities and indigenous communities are on these lands. So these lands have a conflict in terms of their legality. And this is where these communities are. Indigenous, peasant, and urban communities, they are pending the proceeding due to the legalization in the Institute of uh, Legalization of the Land. The communities that have been evicted, whether they are indigenous or peasant communities, none of them have had a judicial order for eviction. Prosecutor office, uh, prosecutors have resorted to a measure called cessation of the punishable act. With that argument, they have gone to the communities joined by the police forces and in many cases, together with civilians as well, armed with weapons to destroy their houses, productions, churches, schools, and throwing people in the streets and infringing all their constitutional rights. It's essential to underline that the communities that have been there for decades, settled there for decades, some of them then 10, 15, 30 years, also have been subject to these evictions. Unfortunately, we have to say that the Paraguayan state has not done anything whatsoever to regularize the situation of these communities. There are communities such as the community May, May, March 1st, Uadu, which is a community of over 4,000 hectares in, settled in 2012. Those are in the rep report of uh, the Commission of True and Justice. Those are lands with conflicting titles that were to were ended up in the hands of a company, which is an agrarian company, agricultural company, Pindu. Those people have suffered two evictions. Their houses have been burned out, their productions as well. There's also a community, Erizo Mercado, called, which has also been evicted violent, violently without a judicial order. These communities, these evicted communities, generally go in again. So evictions do not solve the social conflicts that are latent in our country. But they are not on, they not only go back, but the prosecutors, the police have kept a kind of siege communities because the advancement of the as the security guards 
hired by the owners of these lands, or the supposed owners of these lands, generally shoot the peasants. Some of them have also been killed and nothing has been investigated. They even do not have the possibility to make a complaint for these uh these situations because if these families go to the police station or to the uh, prosecutor's office they are detained because they have an order for invasion of property and they end up detain detained so that is why we wanted to call your attention on this situation of violation of human rights in our country and i would also like to add that in 2020 the ministry and uh, the public prosecutor office and the police said that there are 800 communities indigenous communities that have to be evicted sorry for the interruption but you exhausted your time already so i need to interrupt you and you will be able to continue afterwards so i will give the floor to the state the same amount of time, 20 minutes for your intervention. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Alon. Good afternoon, everybody. I would like to also greet the rest of the commissioners present here in the team of the commission, the uh, civil society and its representatives, the uh, representative of the UN, Janjara, and everybody present here. I now have to introduce the spokesperson of the state in this hearing, who is now represented by the Vice Minister of Interior, Pablo Rios, the Vice Minister of Justice, Edgar Baguada, and the President of the Institute, the National Institute of the National Development and Land, they are the spokesperson of the state and in these 20 minutes they will have the floor in order to start the um, speech of the Paraguayan state. Thank you. Good afternoon everybody. As to economic cultural rights of these groups and the situation of vulnerability in Paraguay in the framework of the evictions and the agrarian policies. The request of this hearing, the, these are eight rights uh, enshrined in the Inter-American Commission and they also allege that there are five rights uh, which were in the protocol of El Salvador, of El Salvador. We need to state that all of these rights are guaranteed in the constitution to all the inhabitants of the Republic for its exercise and the exercise of democracy as well. The constitution establishes a mechanism to defend these rights through the warranties and the uh, establishment of public warranties that protect those rights. As to the writing for uh, the request of the requesting party, the state should clarify certain situations that have already been presented in the report of January 26th of 2022, according to one of the articles of the CAAH. This, this invasion of foreign land is uh, criminalized and this these are two different legal figures the eviction and the invasion of land the here this figure attempts against the public order security common good and social peace and we demand the protection and for this we need the public force whose, whose uh, responsibility is on the falls on the 
hands of the public prosecution office since 2019 there are alternative measures to prison judges should have certain grade certain degree of arbitrariness uh, in order to apply them or not but with these measure with when there is risk of obstruction to justice this can be applied applying other measures which are not so serious for the uh, detained persons this is therefore suspended and this should be maintained until the end of the criminal proceedings. There is an application on the magistrate of the civil consequently in the judicial arena. This difference which is appointed and the naturalization corresponds to a different a difference which has several constitutional competencies and in this case which are defined by the constitution and this imposes a differentiated criminal procedure in terms of the uh, judicial assistance or legal assistance to people who are in situation of vulnerability in different types of proceedings in order to warrant the right to defense of people. We need to underscore the public defense defenders who have access to justice and they can uh, participate in all the stages of the criminal procedures of the people who are subject to these procedures. This has to do with the compliance of the mandate. And it is necessary to point out that based on the international instruments of human rights, the system of the United Nations and the Inter-American system of human rights, it has been promoted the, uh, uh, the use of uh, those standards in order to avoid the use of public force, and we should also add that Paraguay is adhered to, is party to the Convention Against the Torture and other cruel or inhuman treatment of the United Nations. Likewise, that same regulation is in provides for the use of forces in exceptional circumstances and this is under the need the principle of necessity the institutions have incorporated to the curricula the training for the use of force and the manual for the use of force for the police, the national police, and this is also included, the articulation in order to enforce the law. The principles to apply are developed in the use of force and the manual, the already mentioned manual was elaborated pursuant to the conventions ratified by Paraguay. And this constituted uh, means of support and consultation. We can express that each of the institutions and the terms are harmonized in the standards of human rights and the instruments ratified by Paraguay. In many cases, these protocols are the result of the drafting with the international uh, agencies. The Committee of the United Nations mentions 
and defines these forced evictions as trying to uh, make people out of the communities and the places they occupy without offering them the appropriate means of protection, legal protection or of other kind. However, the prohibition of forced eviction is not applied to the evictions uh, performed legally and according to the international agreements. Based on the foregoing, this is within the compliance with the provisions and the international standards respecting the general principles of reasonability and proportionality. In Paraguay, there is an effort to warranty the protection of economic, social, and cultural rights in the context mentioned by the requesting parties. This commitment with the state, with these uh, international standards, are related to the due process of law and the use, the legitimate use of public forces. Thank you. Good afternoon to everyone. I will uh, refer to the public policies for groups in vul vulnerable groups in Paraguay. In the last few years, Paraguay started a strengthening procedure both in the national uh, 2030 agenda promoted by the National Plan of Development and the uh, global 2030 agenda with the goal to address the needs of the population. So we built public policies and regulations with a long-term uh, approach. This way, Paraguay understood that in order to uh, overcome these different uh, challenges towards the sustainable development, we require the active participation of all the members of society to build a, be a better country. In, according to the strategic uh, access number one of the national development plan, which was updated in 2020, the state seeks to consolidate a system of social protection focused on people and their needs from their uh, uh, birth to uh, elderly people. In October 2020, we presented the National Plan to Reduce Poverty, which seeks to get a better quality of life through different public uh, social protection policies. From 2013 to date, we have uh, 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 different uh, parts of the budget being allocated of this priority uh, social programs. I will mention three of these programs. Componag, which uh, uh, gives money allowances related to health and education and implements a micro uh, health uh, life insurance for the families. This is the social program that ha has reached the most amount of people reaching 254 districts in 17 departments. It assists 7% of indigenous communities and complements other programs and promotes the generation of income through uh, initial, uh, an initial allowance of money to uh, produce. The coverage has uh, increased by 20% in terms of participants from its beginning in 2014 and now reaches 26,500 families all over the country. Then we have Koha, which provides uh, territories in urban areas and facilitates access to utilities such as water, electricity and proper housing. From 2013 up to, to date, doubles the figure between uh, 2002 and 2013. As a result of this effort, joint efforts to foster long term impact of public policies, we launched uh, VAMOS, a social protection program, 
to uh, widen the access to education and health to improve employability and social uh, insertion and even economic levels as, re as regards public policies in terms of uh, comprehensive services. The program Casa de Justicia facilitates a vulnerable uh, population uh, to have access to justice also with mobile houses of uh, justice to uh, reach the, m the furthest communities by providing uh, access to uh, free judicial counseling and training. As regards indigenous communities in 2021 through the Alfred Mention program, we had more than 9,000 interventions through different services um, connected services. Even within this program, we have included all indigenous communities which are in in the system of human rights protection, such as the different uh, communities that are present today. In 2021, the executive uh, branch under the coordination of the Ministry of Justice, approved the third action plan of the with the technical cooperation of the OHCHR for Paraguay. It's also important to mention that this document uh, foresees to strengthen the uh, capacities to promote, protect human rights and access to justice for specific communities. Good afternoon, everyone. I will uh, speak about the uh, rural development of Paraguay, access number three. In terms of uh, human rights, Actually in, in actually, in terms of the human rights of indigenous peoples, in Article 114 of the National Constitution, we recognize that the agrarian reform is one of the fundamental factors to achieve rural well-being. Law 1864, which establishes the agrarian statute, establishes that the regulatory body guarantees rural a state property to uh, have a social and economic function fulfilled. We have INDER in Paraguay, which through several admi administrative and judicial processes guarantees land to the subjects of agrarian reform only if they comply with the requirements established by this law of 2002 and its amendments protecting the rights of uh, in general interest over particular interests as enshrined in the constitution. In that sense, INTER has been fostering since 2015, the SEER program, which constitutes a system to regularize, regularize the tenure of land and through which we uh, seek to make regular the titling of this land, the ultimate goal to uh, provide a space for this peasant communities. In this program, there was a comprehensive approach with uh, data, data gathering of the situation of rural families and also a technical report to approve different uh, measures related to land. It's also, uh, we also need to highlight that the INDER establishes as a public policy, a multidimensional approach to this topic, uh, building systems of uh, drinkable water schools and models of uh, developmental uh, mechanisms, also training leaders and other conventions and uh, cooperations with different ins institutions to train rural families. All of this 
means that we are focused on the uh, economics and social development of the peasant communities. And in terms of uh, territorial demands, INDER has a registry that indicates that there are 31 orders for evictions in the country related to settlements, rural settlements. When I hear that you say that there are 400, 600, 800 orders for evictions, I uh, requested the information to see which are the evictions being carried out in rural areas with uh, final sentences and sanctions. And I have received the information that there are many, many more than 30 rural buildings being affected. In the capital city, there are different uh, different buildings or, or uh, people people who have not paid rent and being are being evicted. Also, many these situations comprise this type this number of evictions. But as regards rural evictions, as a consequence of the encroachment of a property. We have approximately 31, no more than that. And it's good to, to highlight this. All of them are, I'm sorry, the state representatives, let me say that we, your time is up as well. I interrupted, interrupted exactly at the same moment to respect and to be equitable with uh, the civil society. We will continue now with the hearing and I will give the floor for seven minutes to the United Nations expert, Jan Jarab. It's always a pleasure to greet you. Welcome. I give you the floor. Thank you, dear commissioners, uh, honorable representatives of the state of Paraguay and the civil society. Good afternoon to all of you. It's my privilege to be here before you. And as part of my protocol, I would like to say that uh, being here in this hearing is as I am here as a representative of the uh, High Commissioner of the United States for Human Rights. And I'm here to provide uh, informal information and I am not under oath. Forced evictions uh, are the theme of this hearing because in 2021, this was one of the central concerns related to human rights in Paraguay. Since 2018 to date, according to sources and public media information, which was shared with the office, we see there are more than 400 reports related to different types of events that are related with forced evictions and display, displacement of entire communities, protests, manifestations, arrests, detentions, destruction of property, uh, threats, etc. In this graph, we present some of the trends. We could identify a significant uh, increase in the number and intensity of these events over the last four years, affecting more than 51,000 people. Particularly, we have read a register of an increase of forced evictions by the end of the uh, eviction protocol in 2019. And after the approval of law 6,830 in 2021, we also observe uh, a significant increase in protests, both peaceful and violent ones. In 2021, there was an increase of over 230% in this types of uh, violent acts. Violent acts related to conflicts with land have uh, increased as well, which has uh, caused at least 12 people 
uh, dead in the last four years and three of them uh, in 2022 and at least 95 injured people among which there are uh, civilians uh, security forces children elderly and uh, disabled people as well more than 230 people have been detained in relation with uh, trespassing even when communities had been living in some of those places uh, for decades even these are estimations based on the reports that we have received and we see clearly that the increase in evictions represents a risk for social peace if we focus on forced evictions in 2021 we note that at least 11 in the uh, peasant communities and 13 indigenous communities were evicted from the lands, territories and settlements in different uh, actions without any uh, durable, long lasting uh, such, uh, response. To among between two and three percent of the indigenous population of the country was evicted in this period. The majority of people affected uh, correspond to the community of Awarani. There is an intervention of police forces uh, with uh, disproportionate force and numbers. We have seen the presence of armed civilians, which could be acted under the uh, collusion of the state. We have also seen cases of uh, fires to property, buildings and, and, and objects, and there was no uh, judicial assistance uh, provided. And during these procedures, there was no consideration of the uh, disprivileged situation of the people who were living there and the rights of, of indigenous peoples and the right to respect their ancestral territories. It's a concern to us, the lack of humanitarian aid and uh, the involvement of children. This graph uh, highlights the uh, increase of abuses that have been uh, recorded, taking into account that forced evictions uh, have as a consequence uh, displacement. They are considered a uh, violation to the right of proper housing. In the cases of indigenous and um, peasant communities, this could lead to an infringement, infringement of in specific rights of their communities. Also forced evictions affect other human rights, such as the right, the right to enjoy health, uh, proper food, uh, sanitation, drinkable water, etc. Finally, we want to uh, point out that during 2021, a bill that sought the, the stop to eviction during the uh, COVID was not approved, but there was the approval of the amendment of Article 142 of Law 3440 of 2008 of the Criminal Code of Paraguay, which has to do with the encroachment of private property and eliminates the possibility of sanctions of uh, related to imprisonment. Also, this request, this requires um, more action to guarantee that this types of issues are addressed urgently. In this context, the establishment of a working commission to address the regularization of this stolen lands is a positive step ahead. Our office reiter reiterates its uh, support to all authorities of Paraguay and stakeholders to reach sustainable solution based on human rights and the respect of the rights of peasant and indigenous communities. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you to the representative of the United Nations. Now we are going to go on to the next step of the hearing. The commission will make comments, questions as to what we have heard in my capacity of 
country reporter. I would like to start with the using the floor during these 20 minutes. And I would like to mention that the perception I have as a reporter, as a country reporter, is a different stance to what we uh, hear from the civil society and from the state. They do not much, so we need to deepen on some information that you have uh, Stated, and we require a lot of dialogue in order to find a way to get to some common ground in the topic of concern. I have some questions that I would like to make, both to the civil society and the state. The first question is whether the evictions occurred are as to private property. So if this is eviction from private property and I ask the social civil society whether they have occurred in ancestral lands or in lands that belong to a certain community. So I would like to hear both points of view on these evictions as to the property of these lands, as to who it belongs. and how each of the parties maintains whether they are uh, owner or not of those goods. I believe that's important, those lands. I would also like to ask on the matter of eviction very briefly, and if the state doesn't have time, they can reach the information to us, the procedure for an eviction, whether there has be, there has to be a judicial resolution, a judicial ruling for an, or an action, or if there is a preventive action where, where an eviction can be carried out without uh, judicial proceeding for that situation. I believe that's also important. And on that same line, I would like to ask the civil society and the communities whether those proceedings where it is discussed or not, whether there is going to be eviction, these are the ones that have access, whether you have access to those proceedings, whether you can be part of those proceedings, whether you have a different point of view in that case, whether the, you have the possibility to participate in those, to take part in those proceedings. Another question or comment I have has to do with the public policy to demarcate the limits and title the uh, territories of the indigenous communities, whether that is a public policy, which is on way, underway, whether it is clear for the civil society. So I ask for both. I ask the civil society their opinion, whether there is a public policy as to that and how it is being implemented, because I believe that all these points of view are important and it's important to dive on them. I would like to say to the state that the Inter-American Court, there have been two judgments, one, two rulings, one in the indigenous community, Waki Akse, in two, 2005, the other in the community, Shakmokasek. And there we had a series of recommendations. These recommendations given of measures, here there is a roadmap, there is a, uh, there is a roadmap that I would like to ask to hear from that aspect from you as well. I would also like to leave a message a takeaway message for as in my capacity as reporter. And it's that if we have to dialogue as to these policies, if we have to collaborate, we have to carry out some kind of mediation so as to uh, make progress in these 
rulings, to verify public policies. We are at your sole disposal. We are at the disposal of the state and of the civil society. The fact that the commission has included this hearing in this period of session, it's because we are monitoring the power away and situation and we believe this is a sensitive issue and I am at your disposal as well, so that you can convey all the information, the complaints. There are some data that do not match. And I believe that we have to break it down so as to see what is that belongs, particularly to the indigenous communities and if we need to have a respectful dialogue, there are some pronouncements from the court, and I believe that our cooperation may be of use to collaborate and to help in this difficult situation. But I believe it has been very timely to have this hearing during this period of session. That Those are my comments. I would like to give the floor now to Commissioner Esmeralda Rosemena de Treitinho whether she has some comments. Thank you, Mr. Chairman of this hearing. I would like to read the civil society and the authorities from the Paraguayan states. In my capacity as a reporter for indigenous people, I'm going to make some comments on the situation of the indigenous people. I share with the Commissioner Estuardo that hearings have this value for the Inter-American Commission, which is just that, to listen the parties. And as the Commissioner says, these are two completely opposing positions and stances in terms of the complaint made by the civil society and in that, along those lines, I would like to ask the state in relation to also to the civil society, the critical aspect of what has been posed here is the existence of over 7 million hectares of land that are qualified as ill-gotten. In this sense, the titling of the line of the land and the management of those proceedings, I believe is essential. It's essential to determine, to effectively determine which are, which is a reality of that situation. Anna was telling us the protection, the constitutional protection that the rights of indigenous peoples have and so there is a complaint that there, that protection to the territories, to the lands, well, it's not being given, it's not being afforded. So this needs, well, this calls for a coordinated response. The commissioner calls um, upon to hold a dialogue, which I believe it's essential to Listen to both positions. She muted her mic. Commissioner, your audio is no longer working. Okay, yes. The, the typical expression of the pandemics. Okay. I would like to focus on what the civil society poses in terms of the demands of those rights and the answer, the position that the state is putting forward is that those evictions belong to a specific criminal type, which is the invasion of foreign land. And this has this content of the criminal law, which we know what this means. So to conclude, I would like to know the following, and I believe this important what the representative of the High Commissioner was uh, saying, if there is in Congress a working committee that is already uh, 
recognizing and acknowledging the need of uh, the titling of the lands of the recognition of the rights of ancestral territories because there is evidently a need to work in coordination with the associations that are petitioning today and are describing this reality in order to look for a joint answer, a respectful answer of the to the human rights protection of those peasants and the communities in Paraguay. Thank you, Commissioner. Thank you. I will give the floor now to the Commissioner Roberta Clark. Thank you very much, uh, Commissioner Alon, and I say good afternoon to the representatives of civil society organizations, of course, the authorities from the Paraguayan state and the representative from the High Commissioner for Human Rights. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It is, as my fellow commissioners Ralon and Arosamina has said, that there's a dispute on practically every aspect of this case. Um, and so it's worth recalling what are the areas of disputation. On the one hand, are these ancestral territories that have been um, occupied by the petitioners or are they more recently occupied? That's one area I think we would need some clarity on. There's dispute on the number of evictions um, and the, the, the number of evictions the verification done by the High Commission of Human Rights seems to accord more closely to what the petitioners, well, civil society organizations have said. There's a dispute as to whether a legal process for eviction is needed or not. There's a dispute as to the nature of the evictions, the use of violence, is, has, been, has there been a use of violence or has it been an ordered um, eviction? Whether or not the lands occupied are public lands owned by the state or owned by private, uh, by private holders and whether there is some right to regularization because of the time or the length of occupation. These are some areas of dispute uh, that I think that we would need to hear some, some more information on. But in any event, I think that this issue has to be understood in the larger context. Um, I, I have had recourse to a document produced by the World Bank in 2018 called the Systematic Country Diagnostic for Paraguay. And in that report, uh, it notes that Paraguay is a country with one of the highest inequalities in land distribution in the world. That 70%, 70, 70 percent of productive land is occupied by 1% of farms. And in the context of that uh, inequality, indigenous people are amongst the most socially excluded groups. 96% of indigenous households lack, lack access to advanced sanitation, and 80% do not have access to improved water. There's also a big issue of access to electrification. So land tenure insecurity, according to this World Bank report, disproportionately affects indigenous peoples. So I think it is in that context that we have to be understanding what is happening in Paraguay along, along the evictions and then what is the responsibility of the state in this regard? Uh, how do they use the policy tools to address the social, social exclusion? So very specifically, I have three questions I want to ask, um, and those are as follows. How does the state, uh, have a regard to the state saying that it does not need a legal process to evict because these lands have been illegally occupied, how does the state assure itself of the illegality of occupation, that there is in fact no title or no right to title of the land in question? That's one, one question. Secondly, I would like to ask the state um, what, uh, what provisions have been made, if any, for consultation with the affected indigenous uh, peoples and rural communities as they move towards resettlement? And then thirdly, what provisions for resettlement actually take, have taken place? I understand from the state that there are a range of social protection measures that are enforced for Paraguay generally, but in relation to the households and the communities that have been targeted for removal or for eviction, what concrete uh, provisions have been made for resettlement, which would include access to education, access to healthcare, um, access to land for production, and so on. Thank you very much. I look forward to the response, and uh, and it is as uh, Commissioner Alon has said, the response can also 
COVID-19. Thank you very much. Muchas gracias, comisionada. Le paso la palabra al comisionado Carlos Bernal. Muchas gracias, presidente. Eh, yo también quiero agradecer a todas las personas. Thank presidente. you, president. I want to thank all people present here today, the representatives of the civil society and the representatives of the state, the delegate of the High Commissioner of the United Nations and my colleagues of the Inter-American Commission of Human Rights. After hearing both the civil society and the state, I am convinced that this has to do with different uh, aspects that are interconnected. One first topic has to do with the actions, legal and administrative action in during evictions. Secondly, the type of the criminal type of encroaching of trespassing into a private property. Third, something more structural, which has to do with the process of titling of land when these titles are in dispute. A fourth item has to do with the uh, statute of limitations the, of lands. That is the, 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 the ownership of people who have been living, settled there for many, many years. And the fifth topic has to do with the agrarian reform, whether it is just and fair or appropriate to do so. A sixth topic had to, has to do with the respect of indigenous communities' rights, especially in relation to ancestral lands that could be under attack. And uh, finally, something that was mentioned both by the civil society and the state is the what has to do with the needs and the respect of the minimum uh, rights among which there is the social economic rights of vulnerable uh, populations that is we have seven big topics on which there are conflicts disagreements uh, or lack of satisfaction i know that the, sta the state is trying to devise state policies involving the three branches of power and that these are problems that are structured problems that are not easily solved and on which we should reflect and of course especially we need to dialogue on so basically i have two questions one of them is uh for the civil society and it's whether they can uh, say if they are being or have been consulted for the drafting of the public policies that have to address these topics. And then the state representatives mentioned that some of these aspects are included in the national development plan that is being discussed and that will be enforced in Paraguay soon. So I would like to know if as a state policy, there are two items related to public policies unrelated to the seven topics I mentioned. One has to do with the consultation with these indigenous communities, which some maybe the commission could uh, uh, help with. And the second aspect has to do with the possibility of incorporate into those policies any of the inter-American standards that apply and those who were mentioned by Commissioner uh, Rallon, but not only those, but actually others that derive from the United Nations uh, system, which could provide more legitimacy to those public policies. So th those, that would be my question uh, addressed to the state. And of course, I'm very um, happy to be part of this dialogue. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Commissioner. We will um, use some of the minutes that we will, were going to use at the end to give the floor to our special rapporteur, Soledad Garcia Munoz. I uh, give you a couple of minutes. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman of this hearing. It's very kind to uh, provide some minutes for such an important important hearing as 
the United Nations representative mentioned, there are many economic, uh, social, cultural, and environmental rights involved in the situation. I will start my intervention uh, quite quickly, but I wanted to first greet the civil society and the honorable state of Paraguay. Out of all those rights that he mentioned, uh, housing, water, health, education, I think we should add one more, which is the right to work of this indigenous or peasant, sorry, peasant communities. The peasantry has uh, gained recognition in international law. So in 2013, we adopted a declaration of the rights of peasant people, which shows such as uh, in relation with the indigenous communities, what is a vital relationship between those communities and the earth and the land. This speaks to the fact that these families have to have the uh, capacity to earn a living with working with land. And leads, this leads me to a reflection related to pub, uh, private property related to the San Jose the Costa Rica protocol, which also has to do with the social function of property, especially when it comes to properties that are involved with ancestral relationships, which could put at risk any human rights. So I would request you to uh, take into account this such rich international regulatory frame, framework, and especially the definition of forced eviction related to uh, uh, different documents, which also share light on the fact that this has to do with forcibly uh, displacing people who are uh, occupying some line with that providing legal uh, mechanisms or aid and prohibiting their uh, connection to those lands. So what is central here is the people who are leaving these lands which do not have any means of legal protection or access to those protections. So I would like to uh, mention two specific questions, the relationship between this and human rights, which is also connected to concentration of land, as uh, Commissioner Clark pointed out, and also the, the cultivation of soybeans, which is quite ex extensive in Paraguay. And secondly, I want to uh, bring to the Commission this great concern, which has to do that this is happening in a context of the pandemic. And the Commission has been cl very clear in terms of its uh, recommendation as to how the states have to uh, bring to motion their, their system. So we are here to assist them in this direction as well. Thank you very much, Madam Rapporteur. We are headed into the final part of this hearing. I will give the floor for 10 minutes to the civil society. And I will be very rigorous with time, but if you have any comments that you cannot uh, you cannot make in this time, you can send it in writing and I will do as well with the state. So I give the floor to the civil society for 10 minutes. Honorable commissioners, representative of Redesca, representative of the United Nations and the state of Paraguay, good afternoon to uh, answer your question in relation to which is the procedure for evictions, it's important to uh, know that the representatives of the, of the state of Paraguay, it's the third time in a hearing of this commission that they say that this procedure is uh, included in the civil criminal code. However, in most of the forced evictions last year, we saw that they were carried out by without any judicial order for eviction. They are uh, inventing, making up different uh, crime types, uh, such as uh, the identification of person. And with those types, they are evicting 
populations that were settled there for more than 10 years and they are leaving them on the streets and they are bypassing the internal procedures it's there is no place for prior uh, consultation regarding a tenure on also the different guidelines and recommendations from the international community in terms of forced evictions are not being complied either in relation to the question that has to do with uh, the eviction of private property or ancestral lands yes this takes place but the problem is that those eight million hectares that uh, are being uh, mentioned as ill-gotten uh, lands are actually uh, titled but those titles are being provided by a commission which uh, qualified them as ill-gotten lands so those titles are in question and these evictions are being carried out without considering this situation without discussing that reality that's that questionable titling this is what happens with ancestral lands as well. There is a mechanism in place and the state does not follow a procedure to determine if this is effectively an ancestral land or what cultural elements are present there, but rather they take into account a copy. Sometimes it's not an authenticated copy, just a copy of a title. They ex execute the eviction and then they they review the case and in relation to the to whether there is a need of a dialogue a respectful dialogue we believe it is necessary and this is what is not being done because there have been amendments to laws for instance the amendment to the the modification of the crime of encroachment turning that into crime without having a wide discussion with the sectors that are being affected by the situation and without the state creating an alternative or public policies especially on two topics what are the consequences first because this these are the consequence of two things these evictions first there is no policies for accessing land and secondly these lands are uh, in the hands of a minority with a, such a large political clout and economic power is there uh, work in congress to recognize on such a land well there has not been uh, any work any tasks to this to this goal to see how many ancestral lands there are or what are their their sizes there is no work being carried out to to that end well so this is why we consider that the public policy implemented by the state of Paraguay is focused on something that is not democratic because there is no uh, full participation of the stakeholders. It's also regressive because the representative of the United Nations uh, mentioned himself that a protocol for forced evictions that was enforced until uh, 2019 was was removed was revoked we have always questioned those that protocol because we considered it was not in line with international standards for evictions but they revoked it in 2019 and right now there is no protocol to protect people against forced evictions also in 2008 there was an amendment of uh, the penalization of two to five years of imprisonment for uh, trespassing and last year it was increased to five to ten years so on the one hand we have a re repressive policy and on the other hand there is no alternative to access justice or land while the state's policy related to land is focused focused on regularizing specific 
colony specific lands, there is no alternative for the people who have no the possibility to access a lot of land. This is what's concerning because this is what's central. And also those lands which right now are being regularized by the state of Paraguay are the consequence of occupations from 1989 up to date. Most cases, these lands were not, uh, the peasants uh, only were able to settle in those lands because they did not have access to land and that meant repression imprisonment and even death of many of those persons. Well, firstly, this situation that brings us here to express our opinion by the civil society and the state as well. One month ago, they wanted to pose the alternative uh, for solutions for evictions and there were representatives of the different public institutions and public agencies i believe there was uh, the the ministry of development there are 25 institutions that were part of this if it wasn't for this we were not we would not be here debating on this topic i believe that what we are missing is the political will on the state. And there are hundreds of laws that favor us as indigenous people. There are also instruments that have not been complied with. So criminalization and forced evictions are not protected or warranted as such. And I believe that those people affected from the indigenous, 19 indigenous peoples, our main concern is up to when this situation is going to continue. How long is it going to last? Because our generations, children, adolescents, youth, do not, it's really difficult for us to act before the situations. They uh, take our territories, but also our dignities, they humiliate us. And needless to say, the term that brings us to what he was mentioning, private property. Well, we as indigenous peoples, we have titles for indigenous communities, but those titles are not considered as private property, even though we live in the communities and that is not private property those are there are families there occupying those lands so we should look for both interpretations for those construals these evictions are the same but some people are being benefited from them Within the last few seconds I have, Mr. Chairman, I would like to close our intervention in these additional 10 minutes. And I would just to like to express a petition on the side of the civil society. We request the participation of the civil society in the commission created to establish the procedures for recovery of these ill-gotten lands that were mentioned in this hearing, and this is a step we celebrate and we would like it to continue. But we would also request that the Office of the High Commissioner of the United Nations for Human Rights through a specialist that can be part of this initiative, legislative initiative in Paraguay from which we want to take part. On the other hand, we would like, I am really sorry, I don't want to interrupt you, but we have already, we are, the time is over. You can send us a petition in writing. So we are going to take down notes and I will give this 
state 10 minutes with its these 40 additional seconds as well. As to the police, as representative of the Ministry of Interior, it's important to clarify that the Ministry of Interior as the warrantor of the state is zealous of the compliance of the, the compliance of the duty that establishes the Inter-American Commission. So within this framework, we established a protocol, a resolution through which the policy should comply with several conditions established by the United Nations in order to comply with the uh, evictions according to international laws. Uh, all the possibilities of evictions and the people affected have to be previously notified with a sufficient deadline and the eviction they should be clarified on the purpose of, uh, of that will be addressed attained to those lines. And the representatives of the states have to be present on at the time of the evictions and all the communities have to be duly identified. The eviction is not carried out when there is bad weather unless the evicted people uh, express their consent. There are re redresses for people who were evicted and they can ask for the redress in the courts. And the people affected have to be compensated. This is part of the protocol that the Paraguayan state has implemented. And the Ministry of Interior has required the police that all eviction procedures has to be co communicated to the Ministry of Interior before its execution so that they have the proper follow-up. We would like to clarify that evictions are made based on judicial orders, based on civil proceedings and criminal proceedings as well. the protocol is not executed outside of these formalities. What I would like to express is that I celebrate the fact that we can exchange. The time is short, but I would like to ask for the opportunity to send in written all these topics, all these questions, answers to these questions with documents, evidencing, and to inform the progress on this rural and agrarian topic. It's good to take into consideration that peasants, peasantry, and the agrarian matters is different what is how it is treated in the public policies as to differs from indigenous peoples. Why? Because they are uh, governed by different laws. We sometimes mixed both questions, both matters. We would also like to express that evictions are made as the Vice Ministry of the Interior said are performed based on judicial orders. These are of private property, who, which where there is a definite ruling, there we have evictions. Some of them may be ill-gotten lands, but in order to demonstrate that there are uh, ill-gotten lands, there has to be a proceeding in the court. So if there is a property title that is not annulled judicially, that title is valid, that title is in force. So 
we need to analyze all together which are the trials that we are going to institute. I wish to have the opportunity to send all this information in, write, in written. Thank you. I would like to thank the commissioners for the questions, also the representative of Coleupi. I believe that it's clear here in clear in this hearing that the Constitution of the Republic of Paraguay warranties private property. Evictions are made 100% made on private property. The Paraguayan state through the Institute of the Indigenous Peoples led a working table of a multidisciplinary group with the end of drafting a national plan for indigenous peoples, which was submitted and was approved in 2021. Such plan contemplates four strategic areas. Interesting areas, but I would like to focus on area number two, which speaks about the warranty of rights, where there is a line of work which mentions protection against any way of any form of violence and with the creation of a protocol of prevention of evictions and forced evictions on indigenous communities. Nevertheless, and in parallel to the execution of this mentioned plan, the institution has mechanisms to attend to situations which affect the rights of indigenous people. This is developed in the following way. First, they have to be awarded fiscal lands, the acquisition in private dominion and the expropriation through the, legis the legislative power, the END, in spite of the great number of requests of regulation, on, with the effect of giving a final resolution to the restitution of those lands. And to end with, I would like to say, I would like to thank the representative of the United Nations who always support us and this is very important for the Republic of Paraguay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, the state. I would like to close this meeting. We have reached the end of this, this meeting. I would like to reiterate that we will wait for these written information, the petition that the civil society have, they can send it on in written form as well. And undoubtedly with this hearing in this period of session, we will follow up this matter closely and we will request additional information and we will be at your disposal in order to um, hold this dialogue and with the working meetings that we will have after this hearing. I would like to thank my colleagues, the representative of the United Nations, the rapporteur, the civil society, the state. Um, thank you very much. I will close this hearing. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.